welcome to a special edition of Research Files. I'm Gary Waddell. We usually talk to members of our distinguished faculty about the diverse research efforts here at UNLV. However, tonight we're going to talk to undergraduate students about their contribution to research. As always, though, we begin with Vice President of the Office of Research and Economic Development, Tom Payota. You have an undergraduate research office on campus. What do they do? Yeah, we do. It's very exciting. It's a great partnership between our office, the provost office, and actually student government, which is very exciting. And, and really it's meant to promote what our undergraduate students are involved in, in, in research and also the opportunities available to, to them also. I mean, it's very connected in terms of the research mission of the university, but also the student experience and how that enhances the student experience. And I think that's a big part of what an undergraduate office does. I mean, we're going to have, you know, uh, later this week is actually graduation. We're going to have mm -hmm. around 5,000 students graduating. We're really hoping that our research mission, mission is connecting now better with our student experience and the undergraduates that are going to be graduating here, and we want to continue to grow that. Um, it's a big part of why we want students coming to UNLV, mm -hmm. and as they graduate, many of them having research experiences. How do you match the right student with the right research project, the right yeah. researcher on campus? That's yeah. got to be really tough. No, it's a great question, and, and you're going to have you're going to see some of those matches tonight. You're going to hear from students, but you're going to see those faculty members, and that matches match occurs. You know, some of it just uh, occurs because students are enthusiastic mm -hmm. and, and they, they meet their faculty members in class. But I think we also need to do a better job in terms of making that match occurs occur, whether it's the, the researchmatch.com version of, of bringing forward the, the expertise of our faculty and students finding out that through technology and being able to search for that. Um, but also students being able to bring forward their interests through an office like this also that helps with making that match occur too and that's that's one of the, the roles of this office the office of undergraduate research is to help that making that match occur so I think it can happen in a lot of different ways um, through the classroom when students mm -hmm. uh, get to work or um, get taught by the faculty and then also just through students having the, the right use of technology and being able to search for faculty interest also. You are, I know from talking to you this year, trying to make UNLV a top tier school. Uh, how do these undergraduate researchers fit into that plan? Right. So being a top tier school is, has a lot of pieces to it. And, and you talk to the president and there's pathway goals associated with that. Research is one of those. Student success is another one of those too. So I think it's very much in line of what a top tier institution um, is. It's about being great in research, but it's also about academic success and recruiting great students to the university and having them excel at the university. So having them part of re having great research experiences uh, is very much part of being a top tier institution. Tom, thank you very much. We're gonna meet some of those undergraduate researchers coming up next. Great. Thanks. We'll be right back. The United States Air Force has a proud history of leading our nation in embracing diversity. We've been reaching new heights for years by understanding it's our individual experiences which make us strong. You can share in this success by seeking opportunities to learn and grow as a member of a diverse team. We are the world's greatest Air Force, not because of what we do, but who we are. This message is brought to you by the U.S. Air Force. Our first undergraduate researcher is Diana Pena. Welcome, Diana. Thank first, you for having before me. we, if I ask to ask any questions, let me brag about you just a little bit. You're a double major in biology and psychology, and the 2016 recipient of our UNLV Outstanding Scholar Award. Quite a resume. Thank you. Why the double major? Um, so I did double major because I really enjoyed doing both biology and psychology and studying both. Um, so I initially was just doing the biology major, uh, psych minor, but I, I was going to be here five years already anyway to graduate. And I thought if I can do the psychology major as well, I will add that on because I enjoy both. So I, I decided to continue um, with the major as well. 
Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. Since 2014, you've been working in Kelly Singh's lab. Um, I know she's looking at organ regeneration and using frogs and tadpoles in that research. How did that come about? Yes, so Dr. Singh's uh, overall goal in her lab is to be able to study how there's certain animals who can regenerate body parts, but there's some animals that cannot. And so humans have very low regenerative ability, but um, other animals such as frogs have much higher regenerative ability. So we aim to just understand why that is. Um, in our lab, we work with uh, frog tadpoles because the tadpoles actually have the regenerative ability. They're pretty amazing in that they can regenerate complex tissues such as muscles, uh, skin, and nervous tissue. And so we just work with the tadpoles and try to determine what proteins and cellular mechanisms are at play during the regeneration process and you know, just understand regeneration, how it works as a whole. And we hope to be able to apply our knowledge um, at understanding understanding why frogs can regenerate, but other animals and humans are not able to. Yeah, when you get much past fingernails, the humans are stuck. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, insulin plays a role in this. So you're the, you're the tadpole wrangler, as, as they refer to it. Yeah. Yes, somewhat. <laughs> yeah. in, insulin plays a role in this. Yes, um, so my project involved understanding what uh, exactly insulin is doing during the regeneration process. So over 20 years ago, there's a study uh, suggesting that insulin is able to help frogs regrow their limbs and so in our lab we just want to understand what is insulin doing because insulin is known for its role in regulating blood uh, sugar levels but it's also mm. very important in the development and proper development of animals and so by understanding how uh, insulin is able to regenerate or help the regeneration process we want to understand um, how it can control the regeneration. How do you balance lab work, research work, and school classes? Yeah, so um, I spend around 15 hours average each week in doing research. Um, it varies depending on the week. So some weeks um, I have a little bit more, some weeks I have less. But it definitely has uh, required me to be able to have better time management skills being a part of the lab um, by being able to use my time more efficiently. So I have breaks in between a lot of my classes and I use that time to either go into lab and do research or use that time for studying and that has been a great help. Uh, I've also actually started using a planner. I didn't use a planner before <laughs> coming into lab so coming into doing research I, I needed to start using a planner to better organize important school dates and how to organize my, my research around that and that, that was actually very helpful and, um, and I think that it's very doable as long as you're committed to doing research and doing well in your classes it's all very Doable. Wow. Uh, you are, it's paid off. 2015, you were awarded the National Science Research Experience for Undergraduates Fellowship. How exciting was that? It was very exciting. Um, it was one of the best experiences I've had in research. Um, I was able to do research full time during the summer. And this is a program that is uh, funded by the National Science, National Science Foundation through a grant that they give undergraduates. And it was ran by um, Dr. Regner and Dr. Robledo as part of the life sciences. And um, I found it very valuable because I, by doing research full time, I was able to get a glimpse of what that is like. I don't do a full time during the semester. So um, I was able to do a lot more uh, experiments, get results a lot quicker than I'm usually used to, which is also nice when you're mm -hmm. doing the work and you're seeing that it's paying off. And um, I also was able to live on campus for free. The program pays for that. There you go. Yeah, that was nice. I don't normally <coughs> live on campus. I live with my parents, so that was a nice experience. And um, they also, as part of the program, they bring a lot of out-of-state students as well to, to do research here at UNLV. And it was nice meeting out-of-state students along with other Las Vegas students, and it was a great experience overall. Wow, congratulations. Thank you very much. Good luck much. in your future. I know it will be bright no matter what you decide is your final destination. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be right back. In Vietnam, we took care of each other. In combat, you look out for your battle buddy. I'd do anything for my unit. When things get tough, it's great to know somebody's there for you. Every step of the way. DAV stands behind America's veterans to make their transition back home easier with free services and help getting the benefits they've earned. Help us fulfill the promise to our men and women who served. Go to DAV.org to learn more. Drownings are a leading cause of death for young children. Simple safety steps are the best way to prevent these tragedies. Make sure kids learn how to swim. Always watch them in and around water. Properly fence all pools and stay away from drains. 
Consider the steps you take, then add a few more. Because you never know which pool safety step will save a life, until it does. Simple steps save lives. To learn some new ones, visit PoolSafely.gov. Our next guests are Nora Cabroy, Dr. Nora Cabroy, Professor of Life Sciences and Undergraduate Researcher, and Kayvon Etabar. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being with us. Um, first, congratulations in order, Dr. Cabroy. Or Cabroy, you were named as an Outstanding Research Mentor. Thank you. That was very, very nice. Yeah, it was fantastic. And this guy nominated you, and uh, you participated in this summer 2015 NSF Echo S EPSCOR program. Tell us about that. So the EPSCOR program is um, basically to allow research uh, grant opportunities for undergraduates to carry out research that would be competitive to their for their um, undergraduate institutions. So mine was focusing on the Alzheimer's disease project that we work on in our laboratory. Yeah, let's talk about the, the, the work that you're both investigating. I understand you study the retina of the eye to determine factors that may lead to blindness and, and uh, have other indicators, right? Yes, um, so essentially uh, what I'm really interested with is on retinal degeneration. So um, if you look at the eye, for example, every single day, uh, the outer tips of photoreceptors, those are the cells that are responsible for um, processing the light and converting light to electrical signals and um, bringing it into the brain such that the brain could actually interpret the message. However, just as a part of normal physiological process, um, the tips of the photoreceptors are actually shed every single day. We don't know that, we don't notice that because there is no inflammation. Otherwise, you know, our, our eyes would turn red all the time, but it doesn't happen. However, if there are any, anything that could ris disrupt that particular process, so it's shed and it's eaten by a specific type of cell, then those tips are actually, um, they would somehow um, be uh, not eaten and just, um, be found between the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium cells and eventually they become toxic to the eyes. So that's how we get retinal degeneration and eventually blindness. So for my part, I'm really interested in why uh, retinal degeneration happens. Mm -hmm. And a while back, I have uh, identified a protein that acts as a bridge between the outer segments and the retinal pigment epithelium cells, those cells that are responsible for eating. So I characterized those and um, I was able to determine the receptors, so the protein that it's actually uh, contacting on the retinal pigment epithelium cells. Um, I know the exact part of the protein that contacts the receptor. I also know the exact part of the protein that contacts the photoreceptor outer segments. So from there, um, for us, you know, other than that, that the protein is doing as a bridge, um, is it enough to actually produce that particular phenotype or manifestation of blindness? So I move on to investigate further because by looking at the characteristic of the protein, the protein is also what we call as a transcription factor. So right now we're also investigating um, the fact that it could regulate other sets of genes, especially those genes that are involved in oxidative stress. So meaning those genes that impacts, you know, when there is so much oxidation process and then they could kill the cells. It's so amazing how one thing leads to, to a whole bunch of other different yes. things. And, and actually uh, my project that that Kavon is doing is an offshoot of that knowledge. So in the brain, with especially with Alzheimer's disease, what we know is that there's an accumulation of amyloid beta proteins. They aggregate in the brain. And eventually when there's too much of them, of course, they put too much pressure on the brain cells and the brain cells die. What well, we also know is that um, we have a natural process of actually um, clearing those, but that process goes through a very inflammatory pathway. So our protein is involved in a process in the eye, involved in a process that is anti-inflammatory. So we kind of harness that information. So on our case, we design 
a hybrid protein. Part of it contacts the receptor that is non-inflammatory, and the part of it actually is responsible for contacting amyloid beta. And K-bone is responsible for screening those uh, amyloid beta binding proteins, yeah. the ones that could contact the amyloid beta part. How did you get involved in this? How did you, you find an interest in this? So um, I initially took Dr. Cabroy's molecular genetics course, mm -hmm. and um, at the end of the course, she um, was gracious enough to off, um, offer research opportunities to any of the, her undergraduates that were interested. So um, the class was, uh, still remains the favorite of my undergraduate career, wow. and I decided to um, take a, her up on that opportunity. I was interviewed, and I was fortunate enough to have received a position in her laboratory. Get it from both sides here. How, why do you think it's important for undergraduates to be involved in research? So to be an under, for, it's important for undergraduates to be involved in research because you not only get to learn technical skills that you can apply in your career, whether it's research, medicine, or any other kind of professional biology field, but you also get to see the application of what you learn in lectures uh, practically in the work environment with regards to biology and research. Do you know where you're headed yet? I hope to go to medical school. Oh, okay, very good. Why is it important for you to have undergraduates? Well, I mean... Um, they work cheap? Not necessarily, <laughs> actually. I support them really well through fellowships, for example. Uh -huh. I help them out in getting fellowships. But other than that, these are the future generation of scientists. And for me, regardless of whether they go to, to grad school or medical school afterwards, it's very important that they know the basics of research, that they actually understand the actual process of getting the information and experimentation. And uh, later on, they should be able, those are the skills that they need regardless of what professions they go to. Well, you sound like you're a long ways past basic research. So Absolutely. It's, it's congratulations. There's so many people dealing with Alzheimer's in this country one way or another. I hope you make a lot of progress on that. Thank you so much for being with us, Thank you. both Thank of you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Oh, hey, bud. Oh. Where, uh, where are you headed? Uh, I'm just going to hang out. It's a school night. With Gary and Todd? Yeah. Not sure about those two. I've been meaning to ask you. This is tougher than I thought. Is there any drinking going on in this crowd? No. I hope not, because alcohol can lead you to say things and do things that you really wish you hadn't. Isn't this what you're supposed to say? I know. So if any of your buddies ever pressure you to take a drink, just tell them you promised your dad you wouldn't. I'd do anything to keep you safe. Okay, I will. I hope this is working. I promise. Love you too, Dad. They really do hear you. Brian. Yeah? So start the conversation even before they're teenagers. Good idea. For tips on what to say, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. A message from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. I realized at that moment, when we first saw the damage, these people really needed us. And I was going to make a difference, right here in my community. Together with local responders, we cleared trees and collapsed walls. We had to get to the family trap beneath. As a citizen soldier, I made a difference. Be there for your community at NationalGuard.com. Our final guests this evening come from the Department of Film. We have Assistant Professor Brett Levner, Film and New Media Specialist Jason Edmiston, and Undergraduate Carrie Ann Cahall. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being with us tonight. You produced a feature film called The Track. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. Okay, it's a, um, an independent feature film uh, about an underage sex trafficking victim here in Las Vegas. Um, it was produced and created by members of the UNLV Film Department, including uh, faculty, staff, and students, as well as alumni. We shot all here in Las Vegas in October 2014, and have just been working on it and um, completing it, and it just got into its first film festival. 
Um, and we'll be premiering at the Dances with Films Festival in Los Angeles. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. hey, you had a couple of showings here. We had a couple of private um, fundraisers for local nonprofits that help the victims of sex, sex trafficking. And it did get a good uh, positive um, reaction from the audience. We got some good conversation going. How can the community, what can they do to help the situation? Um, so that was really positive. That's quite an issue here in Southern Nevada, isn't it? It really is. And actually, um, starting this project, um, me and my colleagues started to do some research because we realized we really needed to be get the authentic kind of point of view about what was how it was impacting our community and we met up with some local organizations such as the embracing project um, which is founded by esther rodriguez brown um, as well as uh, one of the professors from the criminal justice department oh, okay. alexis kennedy and they really became our consultants to kind of guide us and make sure we were telling this correctly very good you were the uh, film editor for the for this movie that's right yes uh, tell us about that um, is this your first feature film? Uh, no. Uh, years ago, I cut another very, very low budget feature. Uh, and I've worked in educational film at feature length in the past. But this is the first recent uh, project that I've done that was of this scope. And uh, your role as film and media specialist at UNLV? Um, well, that's an interesting position. I get to do a lot of different things each week, each semester, um, because it covers a lot of ground. Um, the concept was that it would bridge the gap between uh, film, which was sort of seen as an outdated technology, and uh, new media, so various forms of digital production. Um, so I get to keep a foot in both worlds, and I've worked with the Hughes Collection, because that falls into the film side of it. I've worked with um, HD cameras and ultra HD cameras and new technology and how that can help students um, you know, produce much higher quality much more professional work than what they could do just a few years ago. Did you shoot this movie on film or on video? No, this was shot on a, uh, a Sony digital cinema camera. Okay, so is, is editing video harder than editing film? Um, the main thing that you get when you, when you use a nonlinear system to cut digital is you get more time. The mechanics of cutting film are so involved that uh, you just have, it's more work to make each cut and to assess each cut. So the digital environment gives us a lot of freedom to try different things and, and time's you know, the most important resource you have in the cutting room. So being able to do things multiple times and Yeah, you don't always lose it if you do it wrong the first right, time. Right, exactly. Okay, Carrie Ann, you were the first place winner in the spring undergraduate research forum. Tell me about your research. Um, so my research was in montage theory and I pretty much spent about a year going through recently shot footage and um, editing it together to create a new um, experimental short film um, to apply the technique and theory that I learned um, in my research and prove that it could still work today, and it did, so. Uh, a film about what? Um, in production one at UNLV, everybody has to shoot a 16 millimeter black and white film. Mm -hmm. um, so I went under the theme of like unity and um, like, what is that word? <laughs> Everybody's a beginner at the oh, beginning, okay. so it's very novice, and it was just lighthearted film. Yeah. Very good. Well, I'm glad to hear it, Brett. You were uh, noted for your work with undergraduates so much so that you were named the Teaching Academy Fellow for 2014-2015 academic year. Yeah, that, that was, was nice. Yeah, it was a great honor, and it was a newly established, I guess. Um, award they're giving out to different people throughout the uh, university and it was a really great um, it recognition and I didn't even realize I was doing anything special let alone I was just kind of <laughs> getting the great opportunity of working with students uh, on this project specifically the film uh, the film and to me it was just a collaboration uh, and it was a symbiotic kind of relationship I was getting you know the great feedback and collaboration of the students working on the project and I guess in exchange they were getting credit and getting kind of professional uh, hands-on experience so it just kind of came from that it's wonderful because we get these students here every week or every month to do this show and we certainly appreciate it and it's it's really it's really nice for them it's nice for us it works out really well so Brett um, you're um, what's ahead for you now? Well, you've, you've finished this film. Mm -hmm. Do you spend a lot of time promoting it now? Yeah, right now. So we just got into our first film festival. So now it's kind of like the beginning of that process, getting it out there, trying to find a distributor. Um, and then hopefully uh, writing the next 
uh, project, and hopefully we'll work together again. <laughs> Any ideas on the next project? I don't um, mean to ask you what they are. but <laughs> Kind of just like uh, this film made me realize, and I made this film because my students kind of inspired me to do a story that kind of, you know, could make a small difference in the community, and I feel like I want to do another pro-social themed feature in the future. Is this a documentary, or was it, it was a, a, a film... It's fiction. it's fiction. It's not a documentary. It's a fictional film just because that's sort of like my passion. Um, I love working with actors and we got to use a lot of actors from the local community as well as Los Angeles. Um, and there's a little bit more. We could craft the story a little bit more because it's fictional. Very good. So what's ahead for you? <laughs> I'm waiting for Brett to finish the next movie. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. In the long term? Um, I just keep looking for stuff to edit. It was a great experience to work on this film, and uh, I really enjoyed it, so I'm trying to uh, find as much of that work as I can. I'd like to thank the Academy someday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be good. That would be nice, wouldn't it? And for you, what's ahead? Um, I actually accepted an offer with UNLV's MFA in Creative Writing program, oh. so I'll be starting that in the fall. Very good. Very good. Well, congratulations to all of you. Thanks for being with us today, and congratulations on your film. Is there a place that people can see it locally? It's going to play at the Las Vegas Film Festival in June. Okay, very good. Yes. All right. It is called Trans... The Track. It's what? The Track. The Track. Okay. We will look for it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks for being with Thank us. Thank you. That's going to do it for us for the research files. I'm Gary Waddell. Have a nice evening.